In our last two lessons, we've been looking at various approaches to Tutti orchestration. In this lesson, I want to look at a couple of Tutti passages from Stravinsky's Petrushka. The first one comes from the first scene, the Shreftide Fair. This is a different kind of thinking for full orchestra. You may notice a few small differences between the score and the audio. Stravinsky modified his orchestration in 1947, and the score you see here is the original 1911 version. Many examples of the earlier version exist on YouTube. Let's listen. Here Stravinsky has created a very rich musical texture. Having introduced various elements of the texture in the preceding bars, now the full orchestra is playing. The main line develops in the oboes and piccolos, which first prepare a repeated note motive, then carry it a bit further on the next page. Finally, at the end of the second page, the trumpets enter with the same motive, although without the little sixteenth note triplet we hear in the upper woodwind. At the climax of this passage, the music moves on to another idea. The new idea has actually been anticipated in the lower strings and woodwinds on page 3. The accompaniment is what I want to focus on here, since we haven't yet looked at this kind of textural orchestration. By textural, I mean a rich tableau where no one instrument really dominates. The point is, more to create the impression of a crowd, which is the visual idea behind this passage, where everyone is moving, but not all in the same way. Let's look at each element in the texture. First, there are three horns doing eighth note trills. The clarinets and flutes do something similar an octave higher, but in sixteenth notes. Violas double the horns, framed by the second violins. The top notes in the second violin are the same as the flutes in sixteenth notes. But the second violin lower pitches are in eighth notes. Given all these instruments playing, with this kind of variation in rhythm, the effect is not that of a line or lines, but rather just of restless movement around one chord. Another layer of the texture is made up of the weaving sixteenth note figure in the violins around the same notes as the horns, D and A, but an octave higher. To enrich the upper register, harps to less than piano all do variations of the same idea. Note how harp one also has glissandos. Again, the point here is not to have everybody doing the same thing, but rather to vary the idea in the first violins to create a rich sense of movement. As we mentioned already, the idea in the bassoons and lower strings is going to become important. Incidentally, it is also an augmentation of the motive in the flutes and trumpets, most people will not notice this since they sound so different. On page 11, once the bass idea stops, first one trumpet is added to the top idea, then cornet as well, on page 12, an octave higher. This process is repeated on page 13. Note the changes in the last bar on page 13. Stravinsky adds a tambourine roll, the cellos are added to the tremolo accompaniment, violins and then flutes, clarinets, bassoons, harps and violins all have a rushing 32nd note scale. On the last beat, all the motion stops right into a climactic chord, so a trombones enter here as well. This climax proves to the beginning of the next scene. This brings up an interesting point about orchestral textures. They need to involve in interesting ways, and one of the best ways to achieve this is with the formal progression, as we see here. First the theme and the bass moves up into the flutes and so on, then it culminates in a crescendo. Our next example comes from the fourth tableau, the Shreftide Fair in the Evening. This is similar to music we just looked at, but here it's even more textural. There are no real leading lines. Again, this is meant to suggest the energy of a crowd. After all, an orchestra is, in a sense, of crowded musicians. Let's listen. Now let's look at this in detail. The passage starts off with the 16th note trills around the D major chord and the clarinets, bassoons, the horns and trumpets. The first violins and most of the violas have a similar motive, but with a little grace note flourish at the start, as though to trigger all this energy. 
Second violins repeat the basic chord in eighth notes, emphasizing the pulsation. Cornets and trombones hold on to the D major chord, providing sustained resonance. In the third bar, the oboes and the three solo violas have a little rising and falling flourish. Note how the oboes ascend and then descend, whereas the viola solos do the opposite. Note also that during this bar, the other woodwinds and the strings vary their figuration a bit as well. The same thing happens again two bars later, but the flourish this time is different. Here on the second beat, it's made of oboes and harp going up a D major arpeggio, and harp two and cello is doing a rising scale. This creates extra energy. This in turn is repeated as well. Then the music begins to evolve. Before repeating this for the third time, just before rehearsal 84, the clarinets and bassoons pick up the little 16th note waves we heard previously in the strings. When the oboes, harps, and cellos return for a third time, they are now immediately imitated in a higher octave by flutes and piccolos. This speeds up the action. The pizzicato in violin two marks the peak of the arpeggio in the upper woodwind. Now the cellos go on, also picking up those 16th note waves. The music gains momentum. The up and down arpeggio figures alternate much faster, and for the first time, cornets and trumpets do the quick D major arpeggios. Note how the second violins now have little bursts of scale. At rehearsal 85, piccolos and oboes create a flash of light with their eighth note quintuplet figure. Then, two bars later, the bell is imitated. And then another two bars later, so do the cornets. Then, two bars before rehearsal 87, bells, oboe one, and piccolo one do it again, bringing this passage to its climax. So here, too, there's been an overall progression of momentum through the whole passage, even though it's all built just around the D major chord. Again, if this rich texture had no progression or clear harmonic focus, it would just sound random. One aspect of this kind of orchestral texture is that there's almost no literal doubling. Even when lines have the same general contour as others happening at the same time, the details are often different. This kind of heterophony is a perfect way to capture the energy of a crowd, moving as a whole in one direction, but with no two people precisely synchronized. This kind of textural orchestration probably began with the opening of Wagner's Rheingold. The focus there also is not on a main line or accompanying counterpoints, but rather on creating a sense of movement over relatively stable harmony and creating a sense of progression using other aspects of the music. As the 20th century moved on, this kind of orchestral thinking became more and more common.